that his dad's away for a funeral of a uncle. And uh, let me get this off. And I thought Jonathan and crew did a great job, didn't you? Thank you, thank you. All right, got a few announcements for you today. Uh, and I left one out by mistake, so I want to mention that at the very end. I want to remind you that our nursery is in children's area totally safe for your children to go to. Uh, we abide by all the CDC guidelines for sanitation and for sterilization and all that stuff, so they're safe. Uh, we have a wonderful crew ministry. Keith, raise your hand. I have you do this every week. Keith is in charge of crew, which stands for Christians Ready, Equipped, and Willing. And they go out and they do local missions work in our community for people who need it. And uh, last week, he had a couple of people said, I'm interested in being part of that. If you would like to be part of a local missions and just helping people who cannot help themselves, we'd love to have you. Our Wednesday night Bible study on Revelation, uh, we are now in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. And if you want to be part and uh, know how, uh, have some insight in how all this is going to wrap up in the end, uh, would love to have you 6.30 every Wednesday night, Okay. Today we begin a new sermon series called Spiritual Boot Camp, and we're going to look at spiritual disciplines uh, to get through as life comes at us, okay? We have the best military in the world, and they train our troops on how to handle any and all kinds of situations, and that's what this series is about. We are uh, already in class 201, uh, learning how to grow in our relationship to Christ uh, at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, and next month I'll offer 301 for you. So if you'd like to be part of that, we'd love to have you. March 7th, I'm letting you know this now, we will celebrate communion using those little disposable cups that Jason got for us, all right? If you know anyone in Southside who'd love to participate with us, they live stream with us. It's a lot of our homebound or older folks. We just need to know so the, their deacon, their own deacon can take them those cups the week before so that they can have it. But we will need to know no later than March 3rd, okay? So anyone that you know that would like to help be a part of that, we'd love to include them. Also, there's a webinar coming up on um, Christians who've been martyred for their faith, tortured for their faith. The three men you see listed there all have been persecuted and tortured for their faith, and they will be leading that. So I'd encourage you to go to this. It's on March 5th. And register for it. There's three ways to give in our church, in person, by mail, and online. Now, the announcement I forgot, is John Ellis has a pastor friend of his who will be here on March 3rd and 4th. He is part of Evangelism Explosion. I took, I've taken this course multiple times myself. And if you'd like to learn how to share your faith, it, all you got to do is pay for the book. It's 15 bucks. And his pastor friend, we will be hosting it here. Uh, we'll, we'll walk you through it give you better skills on how to share your faith with those around you, okay? So that'd be March 3rd and 4th. And for more information, see John Ellis. John, raise your hand. He's right over there, okay? Um, he will be glad to give you more information about that, all right? All right, let's pray. Father God, we, I just want to say thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the sunshine. And even though more rain's coming tomorrow, I'm going to still say thank you for the sunshine. And Lord, uh, I thank you that you care for us and you love us, and that no matter what happens in life, we can trust that you are there for us. Now, Lord, as we jump into the truth of your word, we want it to be a lamp into our feet, a light into our path, so that, God, as we study it, we can hide your word in our heart and be a better servants for you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and take out your sermon notes, and um, uh, <laughs> Bill... Uh, Brewer over here, he sent me a text this week, and he goes, you threw a, threw a whammy at me. And uh, if, you, if you've noticed in your devotional guide, I basically go ahead and give you all the answers for the outline. And this week, I, I totally changed it up, totally did it, and he sent me this little text. He says, you didn't put one answer to the outline in there, okay? Because he would go ahead and download it and already have it filled out. So he can just sit here and listen and be part of us. So I said, uh, sorry, Bill, about that. I, I did change it up some, not because of that. But I wanted to look, I want, in this series, I want you to think about some things. I want you to anticipate some things. And this series is called Spiritual Boot Camp. And as I said in the prayer, our military, our military gets the best training in the world to handle any and all kinds of situations. And God says that we are in a spiritual war. And life comes at us. Most of you will remember on August 9th, uh, Audrey and Nimi and I were taking a little nap Sunday afternoon. Lightning hit our house. 
they're now telling us it may, the earliest they may be finished is Easter on our house. And part of the reason is, is COVID has shut down manufacturing, and so getting things and all that stuff, they get backlogged. You just got to get in a line of orders that they can fill and get to you. Uh, end of um, last weekend, the restoration company called me and said, your bricks have finally arrived. I said, all right. She said, we will schedule this for Monday week, which would be tomorrow. I said, okay. Then she called me Friday, and she said, I have bad news. The mason has just gotten COVID. It'll be a minimum of two weeks, probably more like four to six weeks out before we can repair your chimney, which means they can't repair other things because they got to get the chimney fixed first, okay? And one of the things that they've, uh, we've had a lot of great interesting stories with this house of ours. Uh, I looked at Audrey one day and I said, we're just cursed. This is all it is. We're just cursed, you know? I don't believe in that, but it just sometimes you feel like that. And uh, even the people fixing our house, uh, the men putting in the new floor in the kitchen, which got a lot of water damage, they pulled our range out, did great. When they put the range back in, we had a solid glass top, they shattered it. So then we had to go pick out a new range. During all this, uh, the, our um, washing machine went out, and they told me that's probably due to the lightning. It was just a delayed thing, so we had to go buy a new washing machine. You know, and then we started getting water stains on ceilings again. We thought they had fixed that. Where's this coming from? So I, I go out, and I'm trying to track down where the water stains are coming in from. And standing there, and I noticed this palm tree up next to the chimney. And finally, the fronds were blowing back and forth. The wind long. I saw that the cedar siding was sticking way out from the wall. Oh, so that's where the water's getting in. So I go up in the attic, and all, all the plywood on the inside of the attic that is really the wall for the outside is all rotten now from all the rain. So I get the restoration company out there. And here's one of my point is this. Life is a series of one thing after another. And in your notes, we can summarize life in three short words. There's always something. There's always something. There's always something. And just when you think you've got this taken care of, here comes the next round of something. All right? And life just comes at you. It comes at you. It comes at you. And, and just when we think we're getting near the completion of this house, no, there's something else. We had to move out for one week initially from our house. Uh, they put us all, Emmy, Audrey, and three dogs. We were all in one little room in this little hotel and Chris Terrasio found out about it, and he called us, and he said, listen, my mother-in-law's in a nursing home. Her house is sitting down at Carolina Beach, fully furnished, available to you. Here are the keys. So we went there for the rest of the week. And then they tell us about a month later, you've got to move out for a minimum to six to seven weeks. And so now we've got to move out while they move everything out of our house into pods, basically. Okay? So if you had walked in our house during this time on the first floor, it really looked like it was a new home. Nothing's in there, all right? And what I've learned is that life just comes at you. It just keeps coming at you. You think you got this done, and boom, here's this. You got this done, boom. There's always something, okay? You either are coming out of a problem, or you're in the middle of a problem, or you're about to go into a problem, okay? I want to read to you this uh, email this woman sent to her pastor. She said this. Dear Pastor, if I could sum up my life in a single word, it would be the word conflict. It seems I have to fight for everything. Everything is a battle. I battle with my kids. I battle with my husband. I battle with my job. It's tough to walk with the Lord. We struggle. We struggle with our money. We struggle with our intimacy in our marriage life. We struggle even just understanding each other. Plus, I've got all my internal struggles, all my internal fears and battles. I just can't seem to stick with it. And at times, I just don't know what's the right thing to do. Now, listen to her question. Why is life so tough? Will the battle ever end? I really hope so, because sometimes I feel like just walking away from it all and throwing in the towel. It's a good question. Why is life so tough? So over the next six, seven, eight weeks, we're going to address this question. Why is life so tough? 
Life comes at us. It's a battle. It's a struggle. How do we get through it? How do we overcome it? How do we have victory in it? Okay? And one of the reasons life is so tough is go all the way back to Garden Eden. God created Adam and Eve, put them in this perfect environment. They had it made. And I shared this morning in class 201, I said, if you want to know how big the Garden of Eden is, it gives us the four rivers. So it's basically all of Africa and all the Mideast. That's how big the Garden of Eden was. That's a pretty big garden. And God said, you can eat from anything in this whole garden except for that one tree. Now you think, thousands of miles of garden, and where did they focus? One tree. It's like the sign in the, you're walking in the store, says, wet paint, don't touch. What do you do? They messed it up. They said, we don't care what God says. We're going to do it our way. We're going to eat from that tree. We're going to rebel from God. And when they did, sin entered the world, and it caused everything in this world and everything in life to be broken. Everything on this planet is broken. I mean, think about it. The weather is broken. We just this week had three people killed in Brunswick County from a tornado that went through there. The weather is broken. Everything is broken. Our bodies are broken. Have you noticed that? The older you get, the more aches and pains and things you have. You don't jump out of bed like you did when you were young. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, okay. Y'all sitting there like, no, you're the only one. <laughs> okay? I've now noticed I'm getting a little arthritis in my hips. So I have trouble sleeping at night. I'll turn on this side and all of a sudden I ache. And I got to turn on this side and that side aches. And I got, I got to get up and walk around. I'm like, Lord, I am 62 years old. I'm too young for this. Okay? And life just comes at you. Our bodies are broken. Every relationship is broken. Everyone. Every family is broken. There's no perfect families. There's no perfect marriage. There's no perfect friendships. Yet we live with expectations as if they should be. Nothing is perfect on this planet except the truth of God's word. Now I want you to look at that again. We have relationships with family, with friends, and we expect them to live up to our expectations of them. Now think about this. We are imperfect, but we expect other imperfect to live up to our standard of perfection. And then when they don't, we blow a gasket. It's not right, it's not fair, it's not godly, it's not holy, and it's sinful. Because everything on this planet is broken. There's nothing perfect except the truth of God's word. This is why Jesus taught us to pray this prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, God's will is always done. But here on this planet, it is rarely ever done. So today, we're going to look at this battle we're in. This life we're struggling with. There's this invisible war, this invisible battle we're all engaged in in life. And basically, in your notes, there's three cosmic forces that are behind all of this. Okay? Okay? The Bible describes them in two terms. One is called the flesh, the other is called the demonic. So let's look at it. The first battle all of us are involved in is called the battle inside me. Then battle inside you. You've got things going on inside of you you struggle with, you wrestle with, you battle with. Okay? We all have a predisposition to do the wrong thing. All of us. There's a battle inside of us. I mean, have you ever done things that were actually self-destructive but you did them anyway? Yes. Have you ever done things that you knew were wrong and you did them anyway? Yes. Have you ever done things that were actually harmful and not beneficial to your life, but you chose to do them anyway? Yes. All of us have done those things. We all have this predisposition to sin, a predisposition to do the wrong thing. The Bible calls that the flesh within us, this old sinful nature in us. And one of the reasons I love Scripture, I, I when I taught class 101 last month, I said, if I was writing the Bible, I would have left out all their faults. One of the reasons I believe the Bible more than anything else is that God left it all in there. He left it all in there. And one of my best examples is the Apostle Paul. I mean, he, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was responsible for spreading the church and the gospel around the Roman Empire. I mean, what a dynamic man. But this man had an in internal struggle, an internal battle. Now look at it in Romans 7. See if you can relate to this. He writes this, I know I am rotten through and through so far as my old sinful nature 
My flesh is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. And when I want to do good, I don't. And when I try to do, don't do wrong, I do it anyway. Now, if I'm, going, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, it is playing where the trouble is. Sin still has me in its evil grasp. It seems to be a fact that life that has what I want to do, what, uh, it seems to be a fact of life when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God. I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned, but there is this something else deep within me and my lower nature that is at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. In my mind, I want to be God's willing servant, but instead I find myself still enslaved to sin. Can anybody relate to that? This is a man, one of the reasons I love Paul, he makes himself vulnerable. He just throws it out there. He says, I'm no better than you. I struggle just like you do. There's this battle inside of me. God says, do this, and I go, ah, I don't want to. I mean, let me ask you this. How many of you have children? All right. How many of you have had your, ever had your children look at you and go, no? Now, how many of you had a lesson? You sat down with your kids, and you said, the next time I tell you to do something, here's the word I want you to say, no. Isn't it amazing? We don't have to teach them to say no. Why? Sinful nature. There is a battle inside of all of us from the moment we are born that we carry with us for the rest of our lives. Here's the second battle we're involved in. First is the battle inside me. The second, there is a battle around me. That's the world. That's our culture. Our world and our culture is not trying to build you up. It's trying to tear you down. Our world says you're worthless. You don't matter. You don't count. You're nothing. You can be the most smartest Christian athlete in the world. They'll still say horrible things about you. We, we go to school. We go to work. And there's this peer pressure from peers to try to conform to their view of what they believe the world is. Even Jesus warned us about this in John 15. He said this, if you were to give your allegiance to the world, they would love and welcome you as one of their own. But because you want to align yourself with the values of this world, they will hate you. I have chosen you and taken you out of the world to be mine. Now look at the passage. Why are we so shocked when the world turns against us? Jesus said, if you're mine, they will. If they're not turning against you, that should be a red flag. You're just like them. I'm not saying we want the world to hate us, but when they do hate us, it means we're doing the right thing. Paul says this in Romans 12. He says, stop imitating and conforming to the ideas and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. So we have our world, our culture. We have peers who are pressuring us to conform to their view and theology of what life is. So you've got the battle inside you, the battle around you. Here's the third battle you got. There's a battle against you. So you've got a battle inside of you you're having to deal with. Then you're fighting a second battle. That is the battle around us, our culture. But then you've got a, a spiritual battle going on. There's a battle against you. This is the devil. This is Satan. This is the world of the demonic. The devil is real. Demons are real, contrary to what Hollywood may say. And even though these Hollywood people say it, he doesn't exist, I find it amazing. They find no problem making all these movies and TV shows to profit from it. They even One of the top TV shows now, I didn't know this, it's a show called Lucifer. And they make him to be good. Listen to me. His job description, Jesus described, he's a liar. He's been a liar from day one. There is nothing good about the devil. He's evil. You see, the problem is we don't want to recognize this. And Paul warns us about this in Ephesians 6. He says this, for we're not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies, the evil rulers of the unseen world, those mighty satanic and demonic beings and great evil princesses of darkness who rule this world and against huge number of wicked spirits in the spirit's world. You see, if you do not recognize who your enemy is, you're easily deceived and defeated by him. 
There is real evil in this world. Let me give you just an example of it. Let me take you on a tour of the world. I don't know if you can read all this. More people are in slavery today than were during the Civil War. 40 million people are enslaved worldwide today, with 24 million being enslaved in the sex trafficking industry alone. Human trafficking is big business, profiting $150 billion a year. In the United States alone, over 50% of the criminal trafficking is for sex trafficking of those under 18 years of age. Girls constitute 71% and boys constitute 29%. The average age for a teen to be forced into the sex trafficking industry in the United States is between 12 and 14 years of age. Most are runaways either from abusive homes or foster care. That is absolutely evil. And we as a church need to have a ministry to help get those kids out of that. We need to open up our homes. We need to provide a way to get kids out of this. If you don't think this, if this doesn't break your heart, there is nothing of the love of God in you. Do you think our God sits back and doesn't care about these kids that are forced into this? One of the reasons they made, made the movie Taken, I, uh, how many of you have seen the movie Taken? Okay. There, I mean, yeah, I mean, he, you know, he, he beats up everybody, which is good for the movie, but there's a lot of truth and how they get these kids. This is why once we got Emmy, we watch her like a hawk. She is so naive and so trusting. We know how easy she could be taken from us, put in this, and we would never see her again. There's real evil in this world. It is there. So you got a war going on inside of you, you got a war going on around you, you got a war going on against you, okay? And throughout biblical history, God has had men and women who handled each and every one of these three battles, and they won the victory for it. They overcame it. They were successful against it. In fact, there's one chapter dedicated to them called Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is what is called God's Hall of Fame of Faith. And in it, we read about people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Gideon, David. We read about the prophets. We read about Samuel. We read about Moses. And, and all of these examples that are listed in chapter 11 are men and women who could have thrown in the towel, but they chose not to. They chose to stand and fight and work through this, to deal with this. And so what I want to do today is give you some ammunition. One of the things our military does... They not only teach our soldiers how to fight, but they give them the right weapons to fight with, the right ammo to fight with. So today's sermon is about equipping you with the right ammunition to deal with these three battles you're going to find yourself in. Now, to help you do this, I want you to understand Satan's real. He's extremely real. Like I said, if you don't acknowledge who your enemy is, you're easily defeated by him, easily deceived by him. So how did these people live by faith? Well, let me give you an opening here. Three truths you need to know about how to live by faith. Learning to live by faith involves pain. And it involves delayed answered prayers. You can't learn to live by faith by relying only on your feelings. It's easy. I mean, it's easy to love God when there's money in the bank, your marriage is fine, and the kids are well, and... I mean, it's easy to love God when everything's going great for you. But what do you do when life comes at you? Remember what I said, the three best words to describe life? There's, there's always something. When life is terrible, when life's not going your way, when you get that bad medical report, when you get the news you've lost your job. This life is not perfect. Heaven's the only perfect place. This here is kind of like the training ground for us, Okay. We're in the preschool. We're, we're in the preschool to learn how to develop and how to grow and how to live in this world. And one of the things that these men and women had to deal with was the pain of fighting the same battles we do, but the realization that even the promises that God gave them, they would never see the fulfillment of it in their lifetime. Look at Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 35, says, but others trusted God, meaning others, other meaning others than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, trusted God, and they were tortured, preferring to die rather than turn from God and be free. Do you know that more Christians are being killed today than ever in the history of the world? 
Let me show you some stats. Over the last 2,000 years, it is estimated that some 70 million Christians have been martyred, with two-thirds in the past 100 years alone. And if you add in Christians killed in countries at war, meaning either a civil war or another country, over the last 100 years, that's an additional 160,000 per year, or 16 million more. Do you know that between 2,500 and 4,000 Christians are martyred every year in this world? And do you hear any press about it? No. Christians are killed. Nobody mentions it. Some celebrity dies and it's news for a week. Because they don't care about us. They don't care about Christians who get killed for their faith. It gets no press. Look at the rest of this. It says they placed their hope in the resurrection to a better life. Some were mocked and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in dungeons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with the sword. Some went about in skins of sheep and goats, hungry and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. I, I, I like that. Wouldn't you want God to say that about you? You're too good for this world. They wandered over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. This battle involves pain, and many times we won't see the answers to our prayer in it. Here's the second truth I want you to learn about learning to live by faith. Number two, some of God's promises will not be fulfilled until eternity. God has got a lot of promises in his book called the Bible. But many of those, we ourselves will never see the ultimate fulfillment of them until heaven. In Hebrews 11.39, it says this. All of these people we have mentioned received God's approval, meaning they were doing the right thing. They were learning to live by faith. Because of their faith, now notice the last part of it, yet none of them received all that God had promised. Meaning in their lifetime, they never received all of the promise that God had told them. And I told you, I've told you several times that someone went through and counted up how many promises from God are in the Bible. It's, uh, BibleGateway.com did. And they come to a total of 5,467 promises from God. 5,467 promises from God are in the Bible. But for example, not every promise we're going to see the fulfillment of. God called Abraham and he says, I will make you a great nation. Abraham did not live long enough to see that happen. He didn't live long enough to see that happen. God called David and said, from you I will create a dynasty in which the Messiah will ultimately come. David didn't live long enough to see that happen. So many of the promises that God has for us in his word, those 5,467, we won't see the fulfillment of them in our lifetime. But just because we don't see them in our lifetime doesn't mean they're not going to happen. This is why these people are putting God's hall of fame of faith. They trusted God, knew he was telling the truth, even though they may not experience it for themselves. Here's the third thing I want you to know about learning to live by faith. You can't receive God's promise of the prize until you finish the race. God has a, a reward, a prize for you, but you got to finish the race to get it. And we see this in Hebrews 11.40 where it says this, For God had far better things in mind for us that would also benefit them, for they can't receive the prize at the end of the race until what? Wh who's, who's we? We. They don't even get their reward till you and I have finished our race. So we got to finish our race. In Hebrews eleven thirty five, it continues. They placed, notice, they placed their hope in God. That there is a prize waiting for them, but that prize is conditional on you and me finishing our part. And when the writer's thinking about this, he's thinking about the, the Olympics that were held back in his day. Okay. And as these runners would run around the ring, they would hand the baton off to the next guy, and he would run, and he'd hand it off to the next guy, and he would run. We still do that today. And what, what the writer is saying there is that the previous generations is they've handed their baton off to us. Now, we're running this race, and when we're done, we'll hand our baton off to the next generation. And then that next generation will hand the baton off to the next generation. Okay? Meaning this race isn't won until the last runner crosses the finish line. God's not going to hand out prizes until the last runner's finished. Remember what he said? They can't receive their prize 
until everyone else has finished this race. I mean, can you imagine watching the Olympics? I mean, I love to watch the Olympics, but if you're watching the Olympics, especially, let's say, the 400-meter race, and you got these guys, I mean, they're just booking. And some guy, he gets about 200 meters, and he goes, I'm done, I want the gold. No, 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 you got to finish the race. We don't hand out gold medals to people who don't finish the race. But he's going, but you don't understand, dude, I've finished my part. I'm done. He still doesn't get anything. You're part of a big race where people are handing their baton off to us. We're now in this race, and when we're done, we'll hand the baton off to the next generation. Every single person at times has feelings. Is this worth it? I mean, when I look at the world politically where it is, when I look at the world morally where it is, sometimes I just shake my head and go, is it, it, am I banging my head against a brick wall? And, and when, then on top of that, I look at churches today who water down the truth of God's word just so they have a big crowd. And people don't get the truth. You go to churches, and you don't ever hear the word sin. You hear the word struggle, dilemma, anxiety. Read my lips. When you disobey God, it's called sin. And these churches are so watering down the truth, their generation is not going to be able to hand off anything because they weren't given anything to hand off. So let me give you some biblical truths on how to keep running this race without throwing in the towel, okay? How can I finish well? Because in Hebrews 11, all of these men and women finished well. Well, the first way you finish this race, you don't throw in the towel, is I must look to heaven to see how those who are witnesses to God's faithfulness. So we go back and look at people who've been faithful historically, and this is why the writer in Hebrews 11 gives us their names, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Gideon, David, Samuel. Gives us the names, Esther, Ruth. Gives us all these names to show us these people in unbelievable circumstances. When their walls, backs against the wall, when their life's on the line, they didn't back down. They didn't throw in the towel. And so one of the, what encourages us is to look at other people who've done it before us. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. I've heard preachers preach on this, and they said, you know, there's this crowd up in heaven of faithful servants looking down at us on this earth, seeing what we're doing. And, and for years, I'd hear that, and, I, and my mother died when she was 50, I was 30, and I'd look at heaven and go, I'm sorry, Mama. That's not what it means. They can't see us. That's not what he's talking about. See, the idea here is not that we should be faithful lest they be disappointed. That's not the idea. See it? It's not that we should try to impress them like sports teams trying to impress the fans of, on the bleachers. These are witnesses to God, not to us. They are examples, not onlookers. They have proved by their testimony, their witness, that the life of faith is the only life to, to live. To have a holy, whole gallery of such great people looking down on us would not motivate us. It would paralyze us. We're not called to please them. They're not called to look down on us. We're called to look up to them. They're examples of how you get through this life. That's why they're in the book. That's why Jesus tells us the story. Okay? Seeing how God helped them win this battle encourages us how to win it as well. Because the God of yesterday is the God of today, and he's the God of tomorrow. He has not become weakened or disinterested in us today. We can run just as well as Abraham, as Moses, as David, as any of them did. Now, when we look at that passage, we have this great crowd of witnesses. I should have put this in here. The word translated as witnesses, martyria, martyrs. That's the literal word. These are people who died for the faith. Okay? They're not watching us. We're looking up to them as examples. Now, we all know that God sees everything. Nothing you do is private in God's eyes. Nothing you do is personal. Nothing you do is secretive. Okay? God knows even your thoughts. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says this, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. In other words, there is nothing that gets by God. He didn't go, whoop, didn't see that coming. He knows your ups and he knows your downs. Look at Job 31, 4. God knows everything I do. He sees every step I take. 
David writes this in Psalm 139. You, God, watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. This is one of the reasons we're against abortion. It, it's not a fetus. It's a baby. And God saw that baby before it was even born. He knows every breath you're going to take. He knows every sin you will commit before you commit it. He knows all the good you will do, and he loves you unconditionally. Jesus said this in Luke 12, 4. God even knows how many hairs you have on your head. Now, for some guys, that's easy for God. For others, it's a struggle. Okay? I mean, you're so important to God, he's counted the hairs on your head. David writes in Psalm 139, you know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You know what I'm going to say even before what? I say it. He already knows. Nothing is hidden from God. We know that. And while on earth other people may not know our private and personal thoughts, but God does. Yet there's this audience in heaven, so to speak, kind of clapping, saying, come on. You've got the baton. Run with it. Run with it. Run with it. When things look bleak, Go to Scripture, look at us, how we handled this. When things look dark, look to us, how we got through this. When things seem hopeless, look at our example, how God got us through this. It's almost like when I read this passage, I mean, I, I hear Noah saying, Southside, I spent nearly, my family and I spent nearly 75 years building the ark before God sent the rain. There had never been rain on the planet before. So I had to first convince my family, we got to do this. They're going, rain? What's rain? Well, it's water that comes down from heaven. Well, what's that? Well, it's going to be enough. It's going to cover the whole earth. I had to convince my family we needed to do this. And while we're building this thing for 75 years, people would walk by and laugh, mock, jeer, make jokes. But then we went in, we closed the door, and they weren't laughing We have this great cloud of witnesses. You can almost hear Daniel. Daniel's had a choice to make. I could either obey the king or be thrown to hungry lions. They pull back that cover, and there's those lions leaping up, ready to maul me to death, and they drop me down in there. I didn't throw in the towel. Like Noah, I didn't throw in the towel. I trusted God, and God shut the mouth of those lions. It's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Southside, we had a choice to make. We could throw in the towel, go along with the king, or be thrown in a fiery furnace. We chose not to throw in the towel. We chose to do what God said. They threw us in there. We weren't even burned. And guess what? Guess who was in there with us? Jesus. So much so it shocked the king. We can almost hear Queen Esther saying, Southside. Y'all know all that favorite verse for such a time as this. Mordecai was pressuring me to go into the king, but you just didn't walk into the king. You had to be invited, and if you walked in unannounced, if he didn't extend his scepter, you were killed right there on the spot. I, I didn't know if he'd extended his scepter to me, but I went in. I didn't throw down the towel. I didn't walk away from this. I faced it head on. I walked in there, and God honored it. You can almost hear Mary saying, Southside, when the angel Gabriel appeared to me and told me God was going to make me pregnant, I could have thrown in the towel. I could have walked away and said, you got to get somebody else. I could have made all kinds of excuses. Well, Gabriel, Joseph, when he finds out about this, he's going to think I've been unfaithful. He has the right not only to divorce me, but have me put to death for what would be considered adultery. So Mary's saying, Southside, I didn't throw it in the towel. I faced it. I trusted God. I exercised my faith. So the Bible says that when we're in these battles, we look to biblical examples we look to examples in our own day of people who are weathering and fighting this battle to give us encouragement. Here's the second truth I want you to know. To keep from throwing in the towel, I must remember to eliminate the urgent and focus on the important. you got to eliminate the urgent and focus on doing what's important. If you're going to make it to the end of this race... The only way you're going to do it is eliminate the urgent and focus on doing the important. Because our lives get cluttered. They get filled up with things. You probably, like me, you wake up in the morning, you got these things you're going to do today, and all of a sudden life comes at you, and you got, when you had five things down, you got 25 things. <laughs> Years ago, I read this great little book by Charles Hummel called The Tyranny of the Urgent, and he explains it so well. He writes this, don't let the urgent take the place of the important in your life. Oh, the urgent will really fight 
claw and scream for your attention. It will plead for our time and even make us think we've done the right thing by calming its nerves. But the tragedy of all of this is this. While we were putting out the fires of the urgent, the important was, again, left in a holding pattern. The important is neither noisy nor demanding. Unlike the urgent, it patiently and quietly waits for us to realize its significance. There's something tyrannical about the deadlines of demands and the shouts of the urgent. They have a way of eclipsing what's important. If you've got a battery and you hook up one light bulb to it, it, that light will go for a long, long time. It'll take a long time to drain that battery. You hook up 15 bulbs, that battery's going to drain faster. You hook up 100 bulbs, it's going to drain even faster. And if you're burning the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. You can have so many irons in the fire, you put out the fire. So you need to do a little spiritual spring cleaning here. You've got to start getting rid of this, these urgent things and start focusing on what's important. If you want to finish this race. Yeah, and some of these things are good things. There's nothing bad about them in and of themselves. But they're not what's important. In fact, this is one of the reasons our lives are often overwhelmed with discouragement. Because we get so caught up in all these urgent things, we never accomplish the important things. Look at Hebrews 12, 1. The writer puts it this way. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that is so easily trips us up and hinders our progress. I want to circle two words there. Those two words are weight and the word sin. He said those two things slow us down. Weight and sin. So what are they? Well, I'll put this in your notes for you to help you understand. What are weights? The Greek New Testament word that's used here is orkos. This word refers to something that is not bad in itself. Typically, it is something that is good and innocent. It is something that weighs us down, diverts our attention, zaps our, or snaps our energy, and dampens our enthusiasm for the things of God. You see, the urgent keeps you from doing the things of God. That's why, and they can be very good things. And this is why you have to learn to eliminate these urgent things, to focus on the important things, which are the things of God. Therefore, it could be a relationship. It could be a job. It could be sports. Things you're just putting too much time into. You're giving way too much time to these things in your life. A lot of the things are not necessarily wrong. They're just not necessary. And what the writer has in mind here in the Olympic days, when they had these runners... The runners would walk into the Olympics wearing these big, thick, from shoulder to foot, very colorful, heavy robes. And they would parade around in these robes. And then when it got time for the race, they'd walk up to their stand and they would drop off this heavy robe. Because you can't run in it. You've got to get rid of the weight. And basically, they didn't run totally naked. They ran in what we'd call less than something like a jock strap. Okay? Because they get rid of the weight so they can run with their absolute full speed. And that's the same thought here. you got to learn how to get rid of what's weighing you down. This urgent rather than the important. In fact, you can die doing too many good things in life. And the problem is we tend to major on the minors rather than majoring on the majors. Some things, some very good things, you just don't need to give your time and attention to. That's why you have to learn how to eliminate the urgent to focus on what's important. It's kind of like money. Just because you can buy it doesn't mean you should. You have to learn that the middle two letters of our alphabet, you know what the two middle letters of our alphabet are? N-O. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. They're right in the middle of the alphabet. Sometimes you've got to learn to say no. To good things that are slowing you down from doing the things of the Lord. There's nothing wrong in saying no. Okay? If you're not doing anything for the Lord, then you need to at least start doing something for the Lord. But for many people, they're doing way too many good things. These are the urgent things that are keeping them from doing the important thing. And so you start eliminating this urgent. You start focusing on what's important. And if someone says, why are you doing this? Just say, 
Well, blame me. Say, my pastor told me to do it. I don't care. Get rid of these weights that are slowing you down. Otherwise, if you don't, you're going to be just discouraged for the rest of your life. Look at the writer in Hebrews 12 again. He says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and hinders our progress. Now, this word translated as sin here is not referring to sin in a general sense, just sins all across the world. Everybody's sin. He's not referring to that. Okay? Uh, this Greek word that is used here does mean sin, but it has an article before it. And when an article is before the word sin, it changes it. In this case, this word is used with a definite article to refer to the specific sins, personal sins of any reader of the text. So he's not just talking about general. He's talking about what's your personal sin? Kelly, what's your personal sin? Larry, what's your personal sin? Audrey, what's your personal sin? John, what's your personal sin? Stan, what's your personal sin? Blanche, what's your personal sin? Jason, what's your personal sin? He's referring to those sins. Not the sins you see in everybody else, but your own sins. That's what's slowing you down too. You see, it's easy for us to see the sins in other people. We're so quick to point them out. But we rarely look at our own that are slowing us down. If you have a problem with profanity, it's slowing you down with God. If you have a problem with gossip, it's going to slow you down doing the things of God. If you're not eating right, sleeping right, getting the proper exercise, it's slowing you down from doing the important things of God. If you're harboring a grudge, that sin will slow you down. If you're engaged in any type of immoral sexual activity, that will slow you down. If you're harboring guilt or unconfessed sin or resentment or bitterness, these things slow you down. So what is sin? Sin is anything God says is wrong, and you do it anyway. Sin is also knowing the good God wants you to do and not doing it also. So there's some things that the Bible says these are good things to do, and we still don't do it. These are those important things that we don't do, that we know we should do. So sin is not just doing the wrong thing. Sin is also not doing the right thing. Look at it. James talks about this. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So you've got to eliminate the urgent and work on what's important. Here's a third way to keep from throwing in a towel. I must run God's race for me, not other people's race for me. God loves you. He loves everyone else. And if you don't go with God's plan, other people will suggest a plan for you. He talks about this in Hebrews 12, 1. Look what he says. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. I want to circle those words there, endurance, and the phrase, the race God has set. This race that God wants you to run is your race. It's not anybody else's race. The Greek word translated as endurance, hupomene, is often translated as the word perseverance, which connotes effort, connotes struggle. This life is to have a struggle in it. It's not to be effortless. This is why the writer connects it to the term race. He says, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. In fact, the Greek New Testament word that is translated as race, argon, is where we get our English word agony. This race should agonize us. It's a hard race. It's a tough race. It's not an easy race. There's agony in this. And if you've ever played sports, you know what I'm talking about. You just don't go out. I mean, do you think Tom Brady just decided, well, I hope one day I'll become the greatest quarterback ever? This guy has worked hard to get to where he is. He agonized. He's got injuries to prove it. He's been in the gym. He's been working. He's been pumping. He's been doing everything he's supposed to. There's agony in finishing the race. You see, we want a life that doesn't have that. You can't finish God's race without the agony. you got to work through it. you got to push through it. There is pain in order to gain. you got to have some guts to have some glory in this life. And in our culture, they're going to pressure you just to do the opposite. So you can't run the race the culture wants you to. You can't even run the race your parents want you to do. You can't run the race your spouse wants you to run. 
you got to run the race God wants you to run. I'll tell you this all the time. God has a unique, specific purpose just for you and you alone. It's not the same he has for the spouse sitting next to you or the child sitting next to you or the neighbor sitting next to you or the friend sitting next to you. They have a whole different specific purpose from God. You can't run their race. They can't run your race. If you try to run somebody else's race, you're not going to have enough energy to finish it. If you say to me, well, my boyfriend wants me to do this, you can't, you won't make it. My spouse, my best friend, no. You got to run the race that God has set for you. God did not put you on this planet to run somebody else's race. God put you on this planet to fulfill his unique, specific purpose for you. And if you don't know what that is, that's what our class is about. 101, 201, 301, 401. That's why we offer them, to help you learn what's the specific race God has called you personally, you alone, to run in this life. So you've got to stop living for the approval of other people. And one of the ways I help you learn this is how do you know what God's grace is for me? You take our shape class. If you're not taking class through one, or you did and you've never acted on what you learned from it, take it again. I teach shape. We'll offer it again next month. It stands for spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, experiences. All of these is how God has shaped you. And all of this, once I take you through this class, we start with a large funnel and we narrow it down to get down to the specific race God has for you. And if I have 10 people in that class, they all will come to a conclusion that what their race is for them, it will be different from the race that God wants them to run from the other nine people. Because your shape determines your race. It determines your run. It determines God's plan and purpose for your life. Think about it. Rabbits aren't meant to fly. Eagles aren't meant to swim. Ducks aren't meant to run. So your shape determines what God wants you to do with your life. And when you get to heaven, God's not going to look at you and say, why didn't you run the race I set for your mother? He's not going to say that to you. He's going to say, why didn't you run the race I set for you specifically? This is why you've got to learn to separate the urgent from the important. That's the only way you're going to finish this race. Number four, to keep from throwing in this towel, I must keep my focus on Christ, not my circumstances. Like I said in the beginning, it's when life is tough, when life is hard, it's easy just to throw in the towel. When you feel like you're at the end of your rope, there are times you just want to throw in the towel and just quit. Say, this is not worth it. That's why you have to keep your focus on Christ and not on your circumstances. And when things get tough, don't focus on your problems. Focus on the Prince of Peace. When your situation is tough, don't focus on your situation. Focus on your Savior. When things are tough, don't focus on how gargantuan they are. Focus on God. He talks about this in Hebrews 12, too. Look what he says. We do this by keeping our eyes on who? Does he say on your spouse? Does he say on Mother Teresa? Does he say on Billy Graham? Does he say on Moses? No. Our focus is on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. You will never finish this race if you take your eyes off the one who's already won it for you. That's how you finish this race. From start to finish, our eyes are on him. I don't know what some of you are going through right now. You may be going through a very tough time with your career and your family, your marriage, your school, friends. I don't know. Don't focus on that. You focus on that, you'll get bitter. You'll lose the joy of your salvation. One of the reasons many Christian marriages fall apart is they focus on what's wrong rather than focus on who can save it. You keep your eyes on Jesus. And when you feel like, I can't handle this, I can't do this, focus on Jesus. To endure the undurable, I keep my eyes on who is invisible, Jesus Christ. One of my favorite heroes of faith wrote a book. Her name is Corey Ten Boone. She wrote a book called The Hiding Place. The book is based on the fact during World War II, she and the, her family hid Jews in a 
hidden room in their house. They called it the hiding place to keep the Nazis from getting them. They were eventually returned in, and Corrie Ten Boone and her entire family were sent to the Auschwitz concentration camp. Everyone in her family died but her. She was eventually liberated by the Allies. Now think of this. This woman's seen some of the worst atrocities of life. She's lost every family member. Now look how she deals with it. She says this. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. That's worth an amen. You see, if you keep your eyes on the world, you're going to get distressed. You, you look at yourself, you're going to get depressed. Keep your focus on Christ and he will give you rest. It all depends on who, where your eyes are. It all depends on where you're focusing. You focus on your problems, you're going to be discouraged. You focus on a bad situation, you're going to get discouraged. you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. This is why in your devotional this week, I give you the history behind the hymn we got called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. How did we even get that hymn? It's in your devotional guide to help you this week when you deal with this point, when you review this week. Keep your eyes on Jesus. So what do you do? You remember what God has done for you. You remember God's goodness to you in the past. You remember God's presence to you now, today, and you focus on God's power for the future. You get your mind off yourself, you get your mind off your situation, and you focus on the only one who can help you. I don't, I, you all know the story of Jonah. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah hated the Ninevites. He wanted them nuke. He wanted them fried like Sodom and Gomorrah. So God says, you go east to Nineveh, and Jonah says, no, I'm going to go west. I'm going to take a cruise. And God says, okay, I'll let you do that, but I'm going to interrupt your cruise. I'm going to cause a little hurricane in the midst of this cruise. And you know the story, how eventually they cast lots, and they figure it out it must be Jonah who's done something wrong with some god, so they throw him overboard. And the Bible never says it was a whale that swallowed him. It makes for great children's stories. It just says a great fish. Okay? And I've had people say, well, you know, how could he live inside of the belly of a fish for three days? Listen, if God wanted to create a full-blown furnished apartment inside that fish's belly, he could have. <laughs> See, this is how my mind works. It's how I think. If God's got you in the belly of the fish, he's still going to take care of you. And get this. Jonah's sin was so offensive to the fish, he goes, <laughs> throws him out, throws him up. And look and what Jonah learned from this in Jonah 2.7. Look what he says. I love this. When I had lost all what? Hope. He's in the belly of this fish. I once again turned my thoughts to what? Lord. When you're in the belly of the fish and you're losing all hope, turn to the Lord. You need to refocus. So stop being critical of other people. Stop judging other people as to why they do things you don't like. Stop making excuses as to why you can't be in a Sunday school class or one of our small groups. Or why Stop making excuses why you can't take class 101, 201, 301, 401. Learn how to fight in this battle. Learn how to get through this life by keeping your eyes on God. God has you in a race. You are to pass this baton on to the next generation. If you don't learn today how to run in this race, you will never finish this race, and you'll have nothing to give to the next generation. You're going to lose hope at times. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Here's the fifth way you keep from throwing in the towel. I must minimize the short-term Pain by maximizing the long-term profit. Yes, there's, as I said, there's pain in this battle, this race we're in. I took you through a whole series on finances. And one of the sermons was about how to get out of debt. If you're going to get out of debt, it's going to be painful. Because you've got to make some tough, hard decisions to get out of debt. So you look at the long-term profit. This is where we want to be. This is how we're going to get there. And you live with this short-term pain until you do. The writer of Hebrews talks about this. Look at Hebrews 12, 2b. He says this. He, Jesus, was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. Notice, 
He was willing to live with this short-term pain. What was that short-term pain? Death on the cross. What was the long-term profit? You and me accepting him as our Lord and Savior. That was his joy. That was his joy afterwards. It says he was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. Now he's seated in the place of highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. So you've got to look past this short-term pain, the short-term thinking, and anything you want to change in your life to make it through. There's going to be a period of difficulty. There's going to be a delay of this reward. Some of you may want to throw in the towel on your marriage or throw in the towel on the dream you have or throw in the towel on the diet or job search or maybe throw in the towel on adopting a child. You've tried and tried and you just, you're worn out. You're tired of trying. Here's how you get through it. It's your next feeling. Pray down the difficulty and pray up the determination. You play down, you pray down this difficulty and you pray up the determination. So the marriage is bad. Pray down the, the difficulty of it. Pray up your determination to hang in there. You see, here's why. It's always more rewarding to resolve or repair a relationship than to replace it. I want to show you this passage from Paul, of how he did this over and over in his life. Next to Jesus, probably no one else has endured more pain for the gospel than he has. Look what he says beginning in 2 Corinthians 11. He says this, I have worked harder and have put in, been put in jail more times. I've been beaten with whips more and have been in danger of death more often. Five times the Jews gave me 39 lashes with a whip. Now you multiply that. That's a lot of scars on his back. Five times 39. Three times the Romans beat me with a big stick. Once my enemies stoned me. I've been shipwrecked three times. I've even had to spend a night in the day and see meaning. The ship went down. He's out there trading water in shark-infested waters all night. During my many travels, I've been in danger from rivers, robbers, my own people, and foreigners. My life has been in dangers in cities and deserts at sea and with the people who only pretended to be the Lord's followers. I have worked and struggled and spent many sleepless nights. I have gone hungry and thirsty and often had nothing to eat. I've been cold from not having enough clothes to even keep me warm. Now, is he whining? Is he complaining? No. Look, look how Paul dealt with this. In 2 Corinthians 4, he says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You minimize the pain. You maximize the profit. I want you to circle those two words. Look how he defines his troubles. They're light. <laughs> They're momentary. They're not going to last. He says, if you've been whipped as many times as I had, been shipped direct, been treading water in shark-infested waters as many times as I had, you might call that a disaster. You may want to throw in a towel. Don't do it. Because these are all light and momentary troubles we're having as we're running this race to hand off the baton to the next generation. So you minimize the short-term pain by maximizing the long-term profit. And what is that? Your life with God in heaven for eternity. How long is eternity? It's forever. I mean, the good news is once God's given you eternal life, no one can take it away from you. Look at Galatians 6, 9. Paul writes this. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I want you to circle the phrase there, at the proper time. We talked about this in the series on finances. You reap what you sow. You don't go out and plant an apple seed today, and tomorrow there's a full-blown apple tree with apples on it. There's always a delay from planting the seed and reaping the benefits of that. There's always a delay. Always. And the same is true with anything else. You want to develop the disciplines of spending time with God? You start today, and you will eventually begin to see the results of that. You serve God the way he says. Are you good to your enemies? Do you pray for those who do bad things against you? He says, don't, God says, don't respond evil with evil. Don't criticize people behind their back. If you've got a problem with them, you go personally to them. See, this is another problem we have in churches. 
We like to talk about each other behind each other's backs. That'll slow down God's work in your life. Jesus said, if you've got a problem with your brother, you go to them in private. You don't get with somebody going, kick, 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 kick. Slows you down. You're not going to finish. Remember, we don't get the prize until all of us have finished the race. And for some of you, you're in different seasons of life. Right now, some of you are in the season of summer. The heat is on. You feel the pressure. You're just sweating it in this life. Some of you are in the spiritual season of fall. All the leaves are falling off, and it's bleak and it's barren in your life, and you're wondering, am I going to get through this? Some of you are in the spiritual season of winter. It's cold. It's dark. It's bleak. And you wonder, will I ever see light again? Will there be any light at the end of this tunnel? Will I ever have joy? Listen to me. Read my lips. Spring is coming. Spring is coming. But there will be a delay in the season you're in until the season of spring comes. Here's one of the things I've learned about living here at the ocean. The tide always goes out, but it always comes back in. So hang on. Hang on. Now, here's your last point for this morning. To keep from throwing in the towel, I must remember that Jesus has endured it all for me. It's so easy to forget that Jesus, when he was arrested and tried, he was whipped with what's called a cat of nine tails, nine leather straps. And each of those straps is broken glass, bone, metal barbs. Those straps were about six feet long each. They tied you naked to a post with your back to the punisher. And he would pull back and he would swing. And those nine leather straps would wrap themselves around your body. And then he would yank with all of his might. He would pull out muscle, ligaments, tissue, tendons. Think about that. And you got hit 39 times with nine leather straps. That's 351 strikes on your body. Most men died from blood loss. Not Jesus. He endures that. Then he goes and they put a crown of thorns on him. And he endures that. Then they nail him to a cross. And when life gets tough, we turn our focus to the one who has endured it for us. When I look at what Jesus went through in those last hours of his life, what abuse he went through, what torture he went through, what cruelty he went through, what unimaginable pain he went through. Why? Because he saw the end result, you and me giving our life to him. And was it worth it to him? Yes. That's why he could say from the cross, it's finished. I've done what you sent me to do. And the writer of Hebrews talks about this. Look at this. He says this. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives and your struggle against sin. Listen, none of us are genuine martyrs here. I hear Christians say all the time, well, I'm just a martyr for Jesus. No, you're not. You haven't, we haven't faced martyrdom. None of us have had to shed our blood for anything for the gospel. So what's the problem? Everything you're going through in this life is part of this race. See, the real test of faith is when life stinks. When you feel dead, when you're just going through the motions, when you're just surviving but you're not really living and God does not seem close, that's the time when faith must show up. So will you trust God? Will you do the right thing even though you don't feel like doing it? Will you do the right thing even though it doesn't make sense? Will you endure to the finish line? Will you finish well or just stop in the middle of the race and walk over to the sideline? Remember, the word translated as race is where we get our English word agony. So I have a question for you. What have you started that you need to finish? And by started, I mean what's important, not that urgent, but what's the important you started but you haven't finished it? The Apostle Paul, one of the things he writes in the letters to the church at Corinth is that they, he had encouraged them to take up an offering to send to the church at Jerusalem to encourage them. They took up the offering, but they never sent it. And he calls them on the carpet about it. Look at it. He says this. Finish what you started to do a year ago. 
For you were not only the first to propose this idea, but the first to begin doing something about it. Having started the ball rolling so enthusiastically, you should carry this project through to completion, just as gladly, giving whatever you can out of whatever you have. Let your enthusiastic idea at the start be equaled by your realistic action now. They took up the collection, they just never sent it. So start what you finished. You may have never heard of the name Bill Broadhurst. He ran in a Pepsi 10K in Omaha, Nebraska. 10K is about 6.2 miles. He's a Christian, but he is slowed by a brain aneurysm. He suffered as a young man, leaving him paralyzed, partially paralyzed on his right side. He wanted to finish this 10K race. He knew the obstacles it would take to overcome it. One of the reasons he wanted to be in this specific race Another runner named Bill Rogers, who was the best runner at the time in these kind of races, was going to be in this exact same race. So he wanted to be able to run in the same race that Bill Rogers was running in. Bill Rogers finished the race in 29 minutes and 37 seconds. He was the number one winner. Other runners finished at 30 to 50 minutes. Some joggers finished around 60 or 70 minutes. But it would take Bill Broadhurst much longer. As he ran, some kids didn't understand he was actually competing in the race. And they said, hey, mister, you missed a good race. As he ran, his left side got so numb he wanted to quit. He wanted to drop out. After two hours, cars were back in the streets. It was starting to get dark on this Saturday afternoon, and running through intersections became more difficult. One policeman stopped cars to let him cross. A nice lady handed him some water. At two hours and 20 minutes, he said the pain was so bad and so throbbing, he said, I just... I didn't think I was going to make it. He said, I thought about, I should just throw in the towel, quit. Then as he was approaching the end, they had already taken down the banners. No one was on the street cheering. Again, he thought, what's the use? Nobody's going to be there to congratulate me on finishing this race. But he decided to finish it. He had started it. I'm going to finish it. When he got to the end, he crossed the line. Out of the alleyway came his hero, Bill Rogers, and Bill Rogers had a gold medal around his neck, as well as some of the other runners of this race. Rogers opened his arms, welcomed Broadhurst across the finish line and hugged him. And after Broadhurst had willed his partially paralyzed body to run in this race, Rogers took his gold medal off, hung it around Broadhurst, who took him nearly seven hours to run this race. He said, Broadhurst, you are the real winner here. You deserve this gold. So let me go back to the question. What commitments have you made that you need to complete? Maybe you made a commitment to finish high school and you didn't finish it. Maybe you made a commitment to finish college and you didn't finish it. Maybe you made a commitment to get out of debt. Finish it. Maybe you made a commitment to be baptized by immersion. Finish it. Maybe you made a commitment to join a small group or a Sunday school class or Bible study group, but you haven't. Do it. Maybe you, this past January, you made a commitment to do the Daniel fast, but you really didn't do it. You maybe just drank water, but you didn't put your heart and soul in it. Finish it. What do you need to finish? What do you need to finish that you've started? A vow to God, a vow to your spouse, someone else, a task, a promise made? Finish it. This life, this race is agonizing. So Southside, that's your lesson for this spiritual boot camp for February 21st, 2021. Let's pray. Father God, we've heard the truth of your word. You not only want us 